uh, we've been around for uh, almost 90 years. Next year is uh, our 90th anniversary, right? Um, and we've had so many classes this year, um, you know, from birds to oysters, uh, bees, um, uh, all, all sorts of things and, and habitat, how, what, to, what to do on your property to bring more wildlife in. But, you know, this is a, this is a great one um, that I think uh, in addition to all of our other classes. Um, and uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and let Eric talk because I've done enough. This is his class and uh, hey man, thanks so much. And I'm hey, gonna dis disappear right. for a little bit and I'll pop on from time to time with questions. All righty, uh, so hi everyone. Um, on a really amazingly beautiful day that we're all stuck inside at our computers. <laughs> um, so what we're basically going to talk about today is just um, turning your yard into something um, like we, as horticulturists, we always know that especially new communities and new um, developments always have that very sterile look. Um, they don't really focus on diversity. Their focus is on just making it green, making it look beautiful. Um, so what we're going to try to do today um, is to get you thinking about how you can undo those kind of things. And if your yard is just not, you don't think it's diverse enough, we might cover some things today that um, will help you out. Um, and with some basic horticulture knowledge thrown in there, because I'm always amazed at like the simple things that people don't know and what I think is simple, but I, I truly see it every day. So it's, it's, it seems simple to me, but I guess it's not simple to somebody else. Um, but like Jay said, uh, we'll just talk about a little, a little bit about me first. Um, and I, I never really talk about myself. I don't like it very much. So here we go. Um, so um, I grew up in Saluda County um, on my grandfather's dairy farm turned beef cattle farm. So I have a huge respect um, for, for the land and for animals in general. Um, I have a huge respect for the natural world around me. Um, and my grandparents were people that always respected the land and their animals in a way that I strive for every day. We had a huge amount of woods around our property. And as a kid, we love to walk around in them and we would I mean we would just go walk in the woods for fun so um, I was inspired by my grandparents to in my love of plants um, and then I went from high school to be um, a horticulture grad from Clemson had four wonderful years there um, I was hired right out of Clemson actually um, to be Riverbank Zoo and Gardens, uh, one of their horticulturists for the zoo. So we were designing exhibits, installing exhibits, um, putting in plants in public spaces. So if you see any anybody out there digging in the soil, just say a good thank you to them because uh, we have an amazing job um, keeping that place look nice. Um, but right now I, I got the chance to be their plant production supervisor. Um, so what that means is I run the greenhouses and nursery at the zoo. And really, I grow for both the zoo and the garden. Everybody thinks that I would grow primarily for the garden, but honestly, it's split kind of half and half. Um, and on the side, I, I am a horticulturist for myself, of course, in my yard, but I also do some side work. It's very limited. Um, it's just kind of helping people out that, um, that can't do it themselves. And more so, it's, it's letting people uh, letting people decide what they want to do for themselves after they get a consultation from me so that it, it kind of helps guide you. Um, and so coming from Saluda and now I'm, uh, I'm in Casey now. And so my yard in Casey, um, and you'll see it in a little bit, it was a very sterile landscape. My house was actually flipped. So my house is from the fifties. Um, it was flipped inside, um, outside it, it was, it was stuck in the fifties. Um, so we have a lot of camellias th th around here. Um, I'm blessed to live in a neighborhood that doesn't have an HOA. So I, I think the HOA would approve of my stuff, but you never know. Um, so I can plant pretty much whatever I want. If you have an HOA, um, just go to them and talk to them earnestly about it. I've run into that with a few clients of mine, but, um, usually they're, they're pretty lenient if you keep it up. Um, it's, it's, they're, they're worried about the, the scraggliness of things. Um, and so we'll get into this a little bit more later, but my, my concept on people um, 
people calling their their you know front yard and backyard yards if you, i i like how the english do it they call them gardens so i'll always refer to my front my front yard as a garden my front garden and my back garden um the yard i think of a yard as more of a like lawn i'll just call lawn lawn um so it's just grass um so garden really i think describes it better so my philosophy on that whole the whole yards thing um it's it's i think that we need to progress on just calling it yard it sounds so harsh when it when you know your yard could be you just tell somebody you have a nice or you tell you somebody you've been working in the yard well like i've been working in my garden so <laughs> i and that that's just a little about me um uh, and my philosophy but we'll get into the I will say ongoing saga of the house at um, uh, uh, Casey. So you can see from the split screen, and this is one of the photos I think that Jay kind of latched onto on Instagram. Um, but the <laughs> the <laughs> the photo on the uh, left is actually a Google image from 2015 taken just before the floods um, and the floods was in my neighborhood. It was actually pretty um, devastating. We had a lot of flooding um, and this house. I later found out in the backyard floods a, a good bit. So I'm, I'm doing something different with that. Um, but within I bought the house in 2017 and this is just I would say this is this was picture was taken in August of this year, this uh, picture on the right. So I think in a relatively short period of time, you can transform something that looks rather sterile. And you can see, um, I'll use the pointer, you can see knockout roses. And I know a lot of people have knockout roses, but these, are, these two green blobs were just two really big camellias. This one was actually um, so easy to get out of the ground. I just tipped it over because the roots had wrapped around it and girdled it and girdling is just it choking out itself. Um, this one was actually um, two or three shrubs um, all together. So that was a little bit more of a pain. These were boxwoods. Um, and then when I bought the house, all of this in here was Nandina. And Nandina is actually an invasive plant, if you didn't know it. Um, and they had the the renovators had actually added the Nandina in here. So um, that was week two. I ripped all of that out because I just couldn't stand it. Um, and the the previous owners did this little bed by the um, by the road, which is it was pretty, but it just it's not kind of my style. And so there's there's kind of a broader view of the whole yard, and you can see it is not purely native. It is a mix of native and exotics, if you want to call them exotics, um, anything that is not known to North America, you can call exotic. Um, but in this yard, I, and I'll touch on this again, I'm sure in the talk, but I try to use the 75-25, 75% natives or native cultivars, which are native varieties of natives, um, and 25% exotics. Now the exotics, you, if you're sitting down there like counting all of the things that are exotic, um, some of them are just a lot showier than the native species like that banana over there. Um, so people think I have a lot more um, exotics in there, but the exotics usually make a very high impact. Um, so we will move on and I will show you in the next picture, me and a friend of mine just, we worked for a long time to get this house into the shape that we wanted it. Uh, or the yard, or I see, I caught myself, my, the garden, at that point it was a yard. So the yard in the back was nothing but this. And so that is all green briar, uh, ligustrum, which is a na uh, an exotic invasive. Um, green briar is actually a native invasive. It can be, a, there are native invasives and people don't really understand that, but um, that one will choke out your landscape. Um, although it does provide some benefit, um, even because it is native, it has host uh, caterpillars, I'm sure, um, and, and the seeds benefit birds, but we all know how it's going to treat the landscape. Um, so in there is that ligustrum, the, the smilax, the, I mean, just uh, choke cherries, prunus serotinus, 
it was it was just a bunch of mess and like my neighbor took this photo and she across the street she said that it just didn't look like i had a house anymore so just to let you know it takes work and i'm not saying that it doesn't take work but this was this was a whole weekend of work just piling this out here and if anybody is tuning in from casey or knows anybody in the casey um sanitation department thank you so much <laughs> for what you do because they took all of this without even having to call um hey hey eric real, yep. real quick we had we had a, a couple questions about um let's see right at the beginning what what planting zones were in whenever you mentioned okay. It just kind of reminded me of it. You know, you're you're kind of in the middle of the state, and then we have the, yeah. the lower part of the state, and then the upper state. Um, are are we in different planning zones? We are. So um, we are in eight A or eight B. It just depends on. It keeps shifting, um, but I think that my personal opinion is right now in the Midlands of South Carolina, you are in in zone eight. You're you're in a firm zone eight A or B. Um, Further in Greenville County, you can get into zone seven and even zone seven A up into the foothills, like really close to the North Carolina line. I think you can be in seven A. Now, down towards the coast, the very tip of South Carolina has shown a lot of um, warmth over the, over the last 10 years. So they're thinking about like bumping that up to a nine. So Savannah, like right below Savannah is a nine and they're growing citrus down there. Wow. So we're, I mean, the, our state spans a, a really cool um, range of USDA hardiness zones. Um, so we can grow a huge amount of stuff in this state. And um, when people tell me that, you know, winter is just a time for sitting back and, you know, not doing anything in the yard, I was like, no, you have something blooming out there or you could, and you yeah. just don't know about it. So um, yeah, right. we're right. I am in zone eight. So we're, I mean, I primarily talk from a perspective of my own, but honestly, I think that if anybody, all the people in South Carolina should be comfortable with this talk. There's nothing on here that you can't grow if I mention it. Okay, awesome. Um, awesome. Yeah. All right, thanks. Yep. So after, so the biggest thing and the thing that I want you all to take away from this is that people do not, it's like, uh, landscaping is like painting. The prep work is the most difficult and the most boring, although I don't think so in this, this particular instance. But the prep work is where your final product shines. So the first thing that you need to worry about in a, in a landscape is your soil health. And it's very, it's almost cliche to hear a horticulturist talk in this state and say, go get your soil tested by Clemson University. They're your extension agent. They will give you a soil bag. They will tell you, um, they will tell you what you need to amend the soil with. And usually all it is, you need some good compost. So when you start ripping up that grass, um, and I, there's a lot of ways to rip up grass and you can even smother it. Um, and what I usually do is use a flat shovel and just, pull the sod up, like make little planks of sod. I dust the soil off of them and then throw them in a wheelbarrow and put them out by the side of the road. Um, so I try to save as much of that native soil as possible. Then I come in with a ton of compost, if, especially if you do not know uh, when the soil was last amend amended. And I know for a fact that this soil, um, and I just saw a question about uh, getting a soil sample bag from Clemson. And yes, you can still send them to Clemson directly. I think they have the bags available for pickup or they will send you some. You can call your Clemson extension agent and they will tell you. I just had to send off something to them and I sent it directly to Clemson instead of sending it to my extension agent. Um, and so the soil is your main concern. Compost, compost, compost. Um, and Jay asked me yesterday where this lovely pile of compost uh, was from, and it's actually from uh, the Richland County um, compost program uh, over there on Humane Lane, uh, where the Humane Society is. So if you're a Richland County resident, or, or I don't think you have to be, because a friend of mine actually got this for me, and she works for the governor's mansion, um, and this was lovely. It was $20 a truckload, so it's, it doesn't have to be expensive, 
Um, you just have to know where to get it, do your research. Um, this was lovely and clean. Um, so I put this down and I honestly, I have, um, I have gone back and forth between tilling and non-tilling. So I don't, I don't till anymore. Um, I, I never till beds. I just take the grass out of them. Um, don't till, lay the compost over it and then plant through the compost. So turn that soil up underneath when you're planting a tree, make sure you get down to the native soil and turn that compost into that bed. And that layer of compost just sits there and breaks down even further and the roots go into it and into the native soil and all of that, that leaches down. It's just, y'all have no idea how like wonderful and like my heart is singing just talking about soil right now because it's amazing because soil is a huge ecosystem in itself and if you ever like the, here's my little plug for like I, I love this documentary because it showed you how diverse and how wonderful soil was um that uh the big little farm uh documentary or the fantastic fungi documentary both incredible um so i i just um I totally was enamored with soil after college when I shouldn't have been because my soil professor right now, and I'm sure I could look him up and like give him a big thank you, but he was, he was hard. That was a hard course to take. Um, but I learned so much in it to improve your soil. Um, and I can't tell you like, start with your soil. If you, if you want to do one thing, one thing to improve, even like your evergreens or you know, whatever you have at the foundation of your house, add some compost. Um, just make sure it's good quality stuff. Um, there's a question, how thick should the compost layer be? And, and you might be, I might be getting a, a, ahead of you here, but um, you know, I have clay right here in, uh, mm -hmm. in shape. And you know, what if on the south side of Lake Murray, you know, when you get into Lexington, it's super sandy. Can you do the same thing with this dirt, the, the picture of the dirt that, that I'm seeing here it, to, in my yard as you could in that yard over there? Uh, but again, one of the questions from, from Greg is how thick should the compost layer be? So um, the, the thickness of the compost layer really depends on like how, well, to be honest with you, in my case, it's how much compost I can get. I like my compost layers at least three inches thick, especially if you don't know what has been done to that soil in, um, in the past. So what I, I general, as a general rule, I say three inches for every, everybody starting out. And then you can lay down, you know, every, um, every fall or every spring, you can energize the soil again with another like um, inch coating or like even just dustings. I go out with a five gallon bucket and carry it uh, under my arm and I just throw it into the beds. And that's what I've been doing uh, all the years I've lived here and even out in Saluda, the, the garden in Saluda, I've, I've done that too. Um, and uh, I honestly think that if everybody did this, we would have a better, you know, better water control. We wouldn't have to water as much. Um, the landscaping would be, you know, more lush. The roots would be deeper. Um, and it's, I think it's very equivalent to what everybody is spending on fertilizer out of the bag, honestly. Um, so that's, that's my thing on um, soil. And the last thing I'll leave you with with this my horticulture professor and I, I loved her to death. And if anybody knows her, Judy Caldwell, um, I love talking to her. And the first thing she ever told us in class was never call your soil dirt because dirt is the thing that you scrape off your boots at the end of the day while you were working your soil and while you were nourishing your soil because soil is, it deserves a, a nicer word, <laughs> a nicer connotation. Um, so we're going to talk about um, breaking the gardening down into seasons. And that's the easiest way to um, garden your yard is do it seasonally because um, there's something to be done every season and you know reliably what you have to do. Now, there are some things that just demand attention and I can't really tell you what that is because that's case specific. But this is how I do it. And I'm going to start out with fall because um, I just think that people, when they hear talks about landscaping, they want to know what they can do in the season that is upon them. So fall is here. 
Um, thank God for the cooler temperatures. Um, so fall has always been parlayed to a lot of people as the great senescence and senescence means death uh, for lack of a better, uh, more colorful description. Um, so fall is not about death. It is about rejuvenation and stuff like returning nutrients to the soil. So all of those lovely plants that were up above the ground, the perennials, um, even the leaves on the trees, they go back into the soil to re-nourish it. And you think about when they, they scrape off all of this topsoil, all of these trees out of these neighborhoods that are being built. Um, and I, you know, I, for years I drove through Lexington County and just saw the, the scalping that would happen. And people would put back trees, but it takes so long to build back that soil layer, that topsoil layer that has the most nutrient dense uh, portion in it. Um, so what you're, what you're doing with this method is just like with the compost, you're rebuilding that in a much faster way. So fall, it puts nutrients back into the soil and that's where all of your insects and your fungi and your, um, even the squirrels and the rabbits and everything turning that leaf litter up, that's like turning a compost pile. I mean, that's, that's like basically, you know, making things break down, making what's called a humus layer. So humus is a very soft, spongy, beautiful um, water holding um, material that's in soil naturally. And that is where all of the, I mean, there's like, y'all, it's just, pack full of insects and and people some people cringe when I say that I'm like no it's a great thing because they're breaking down all that stuff worms everything um so right now fall is the and like coming up here in the middle of October fall is the time to plant your trees and your shrubs so anything woody uh, trees and shrubs please plant them now they will thank you a thousand thousand times over and let me tell you I have planted trees in the spring and they, they suffer all year until winter finally comes and gives them a rest. Um, but if they have the chance to root in over the winter, those plants are actually growing while it's you know 30 degrees outside. So give them the chance. Um, it, it's, it's benefiting you and the plant. Um, so uh, what I'm gonna tell you, like once, it, once fall like gets rolling and we actually have a frost, um, so when, when frost hits your plants, um, everybody is, there are certain plants that I cut down and certain plants that I leave. Um, so when we're talking about bananas and cannas and you know, anything squishy that you don't really wanna deal with um, when they're, you know, the frost has hit them, I say go ahead and cut them down. Stuff like elephant ears. Now when a fall, when the frost hits your grasses, like your ornamental grasses, your penicetums, um, your panicums, um, just leave them up. I, I love that my neighbor before I, like when I moved in my neighbor, she butted heads with me all the time and she's a big, uh, pollinator, a uh, fan. She actually was, um, one of the leaders in the pollinator movement around here. And I, um, I think that she was in the pollinator, um, a pollinator group around here but she grows everything, you know, nice and flowery and she wants everything, you know, uh, looking good and no chemicals whatsoever, which I'm a big fan of. Um, but she um, would always tell me that, she's like, why are you leaving that grass up? I was like, well, that's just an insect house. I mean, if you want to find like insects in the winter, look at the very base of that grass and it's a nice little home, it's sheltered by the wind they, they all bed down in there. I mean, the, uh, birds use it, they'll break off the tips and use it uh, to pad nests in the spring. Um, so if you just leave that grass up, you can cut it. I'd say always cut grasses in February, um, but that's getting on to winter. Um, but really adding diversity in fall is just letting fall do its thing. Uh, when you rake up your leaves, if they're, if it's not like I'd like pine needles, pine straw, and I'm gonna break a few hearts, I'm sure. Pine straw does nothing for you other than it kind of acidifies the soil. It has no water holding capacity whatsoever. Um, it's better to use leaf mulch or mulch or hardwood mulch. Um, insects, uh, 
will be so much more attracted to leaf mulch than like regular hardwood mulch, but leaf, leaf mulch is so hard to find unless you have like a ton of trees around. You just sweep those leaves into your beds and a lot of people don't like the look of that, but in like a month, you won't notice because those leaves are kind of broken down, especially the rain gets on them and they'll get broken down. I, I have a neighbor that has a lot of maple trees. Maple, if you have a lot of maples, I wanna come rake your yard because I want all of those leaves and I want to put them in my beds. Um, if you don't like them, tell me about it, seriously. Um, and I, um, I love the leaf mulch. The South Carolina Botanical Garden, if any of you are, are lucky to live near there or have visited, they use only uh, leaf mold. They call it leaf mold um, because they, they actually compost it a little bit. It is gorgeous, gorgeous stuff. And let me tell you, the, the results they get out of that is amazing, um, not only for the plants, but for the diversity up there. Um, hey, just, just a quick question about the hardwood mulch. Um, I would imagine there was a question about it um, being too close to your, to your house because of yeah. yeah, is that is that an issue? Usually not. Um, it, hardwood mulch, not usually an issue. Uh, I would consult your external, like your um, pest control people. Usually if you have a termite bond on your house, you can read in the termite bond and it'll say something about hardwood mulches. Um, I, I, I put it right up next to my house. Never have had a problem in 15 years of doing it at either here or Saluda. Um, so I think it, it's all about getting good mulch too, uh, because some, there has been some discussion in recent years about termites coming in on mulch, but that's mulch that hasn't been properly um, turned and um, cured because you, if you don't get mulch that's uh, not cured, it will actually zap the nitrogen out of your soil. So green mulch will actually take nitrogen out of the soil, kill trees and shrubs and that kind of thing. But with the termites, um, just look for a certified mulch provider and, you know, if you're, if beside your house is also staying wet, that mulch is just going to hold it there too. So I would always recommend that people put gutters on the side of the house. And if you have a, um, if you have mulch right up next to the house and it's just pouring off and just hitting the mulch, it, that might cause termites to, to come there as well. Um, I know that like I have a system that is around the house and my pest control guy was fine with the mulch being everywhere. Yeah. Okay. Great. And somebody just mentioned gut gutters are a great place to get extra. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I thought that was pretty funny. There um, you go. And, and before I leave you here, we had one place, uh, a, a fella um, or no, um, uh, a lady from Monk's Corner asking about uh, compost for a third of an acre. Um, I guess there is a compost from Bees Ferry that might be high in salt. Do you know of any places, you know, closer to the lower state? You know what? I am not that. I'm not that familiar. Uh, down there, um, especially anything north of like Adams Run, I get a little wary because my my mom's family is from Adams Run, so we uh, we know we know south of there pretty much. But we I I'm sorry that I can't provide like I think that anyone down there should have a conversation with their Clemson Extension agent. Okay. They are very helpful people, and you can call them on the phone right now. And it's kind of nice to be able to get them on the phone and like chat with them a little bit because they will tell you like the best places to get that kind of stuff, especially if they have somebody in their office that likes gardening. Um, I know, I know the lady that runs HGIC and uh, Barbara is a wonderful, wonderful lady, but she's up in uh, Pendleton. So I don't think she can be uh, very much help. <laughs> um, All right. well, I appreciate it. I'll let you get on to the, the presentation. Here. Oh, and I just saw if, uh, about bag compost, from box stores is okay yeah it's okay it's uh, sometimes they'll water things down with sand so be careful about that okay well um she just said that to avoid bees fairy compost okay good to know i will keep that in my brain um okay um so in fall just let fall do its thing that's the basic concept um and we're gonna look at i mean People think that fall is, um, I don't know, fall sometimes gets a bad rap in that everything's just dying and whatever. And fall is like everybody's last, it's like nature's last gasp of just a show. So I think that fall is like one of the, the most beautiful seasons ever. I mean, you've got the colors of the leaves. Everything is trying to put, put on its last show. So these are two 
actually two plants that I photographed um, at the zoo or two plantings that I photographed at the zoo. Um, the one on the left is a, a planting that we just, we do for the public that it just like border stuff. So what you see here is a penicetum grass up at the, or foxtail grass, and then a lovely salvia. And salvia is actually, a lot of them go through, like they have that spring burst and everybody's like, ooh, that's beautiful. I hope that maintains. And then summer comes along and it's sometimes, it depends on the salvia variety, but it kind of tails off. And then like no one expects solidago because you, it, you plant solidago in the spring and it's just, it is literally green. And everybody thinks that solidago is ragweed, and that is totally, totally, totally false. If there's anybody on this call right now that believes that solidago is ragweed, I would love to talk to you afterwards and convince you otherwise, because ragweed has a green flower, it's gigantic, and um, solidago is just the visible, um, that we call it the visible culprit, because everybody can lock on to that. Oh, that yellow plant's making me itch and whatever. It's not, I promise. Um, so this, um, this lovely planting over here is just what kind of we do to encourage pollinators on the fringe of the zoo. And so we've got a big push um, at the zoo in particular and the garden parking lots to um, bring in more pollinators in, in what was traditionally not a very used space. So we're actually like, we're preaching the mes message of like diversity now in your landscape. Um, and just the other picture over here on the right is a salvia that I personally, it's my favorite salvia. It's called Salvia Jamie. That's J-A-M-E. Um, it's not widely distributed. You can go on and, and Google it um, and find it from mail order nurseries, but it only blooms in the month of September. And oh my goodness, they put on a show because they are about at a mature size. It's four and a half to five feet tall. And it's a woody salvia that you do not cut to the ground. So you let it, it's a shrub. So it's like one of those, one of those weird um, shrubs that like will give you this reliable bloom every September and people don't like it because it doesn't bloom all year long. And, I, and I'd say to that, but don't you want it to like give you something? And so it, I mean, the, the color, the camera couldn't capture the color, but it's like a coral orange. Um, which is a unique thing and the flowers are massive and that last little bit of the hummingbirds hanging on here they love absolutely love that plant hey and real quick you said solidago a bunch of times but the common name is goldenrod correct yes goldenrod i'm sorry y'all just to make sure people hey, are jay clear. will get on to me a lot about this I'm, and i'm sorry it is goldenrod i don't talk in common names and a lot of people get on to me for that but um, I only do it because goldenrod can be confused with so many other things. Yeah, um, absolutely. I'm sure there's, a, there's another plant called goldenrod. It's a host plant, I think, uh, for over 100 different species of uh, moles. Yeah. So he, he, has the, he has the benefit of like knowing all of that bug and bird knowledge, and I just have, I know it's pretty, and I know it benefits wildlife, so I plant it. Um, so now we're moving on to winter, and forgive the bad pun, uh, time to chill. Um, but it is time for you to like chill out and you can kind of take it easy, except in South Carolina, you really have something growing, like I said, in all seasons and flowering in all seasons. So, uh, really you just kind of have to take a, you can take more of a pause in winter and plan for the next growing season. And this is the time when all of you need to be deciding what you're gonna, um, uh, talk of like bring into your yard for the next year because when you for perennials I told you woodies um, um, trees and shrubs need to be planted now so just go ahead and decide that now if you want to and all the way up until November and honestly into Christmas so you've got time don't stress out um, and in March you really need to be getting stuff in the ground it's like as soon as they're emerging out of that pot that you buy at the nursery they can come they can go into the ground because the days are starting to warm up, the, the day length, the light, the amount of sunlight we get in a day, you, it actually goes up and the plants are sensing that. So they know summer is coming. Um, so it is time for you to organize your gardening. Um, you, like I said, need to leave certain things up and you can leave as much up as you want. I leave hibiscus up, the birds are all about like getting those seed, tearing those seed out of the hibiscus. I've seen birds do it. They're using, you know, the just senesced material to make nests and stuff like that. 
I've seen, you know, a, a, like deer bed down in grass that I've let, let left up at the house in Saluda. I've definitely seen that. Um, so it's just like, winter is your time to organize and chill. It's the gardener, like, you know, you wake up, you don't have, you don't feel like you have to go out there because it's so cold. Well, just sit down with a notepad and that's what I do. I love sitting down with a notepad and like thinking bed by bed what I'm going to do. Now, plans change, but anyway, um, we all know how plans change this uh, in 2020. <laughs> Hopefully 2021 will be better. Um, I will have to say that 2020 has provided me a lot of time to introspectively look at my garden and um have like huge plans for it now whether those those come to fruition or not but i at least have the the ambition right now and so in the late winter like we're we're fixing to go into everybody's favorite um uh, season spring so late winter what i want you to be thinking about is like cutting down those grasses that i told you to leave up because they're fixing to emerge and so if they come out while the the brown is still up you're going to be cutting off new growth. So in February, like the, like February 15th, uh, what a lot of people say is like when you prune roses, you always prune on Valentine's day. So Valentine's day is usually when I cut down all my grasses. So instead of it, it's, I, I tell my people, I'm like, I'm loving my grass by cutting it back. Cause you know, first week of March, they're going to be pushing out of the ground. Um, so you can also mulch in the late February, put down your compost because things are starting to ramp up. And if you have stuff pushing through that mulch and that compost, it's just going to come up naturally and you won't have to be fidgeting with like putting mulch around already established plants. That's when I like to do it. Um, and it's cold. Yes, I get that. But sometimes in South Carolina, you can find a weekend that it's up in the sixties, which is amazing weather to haul mulch out and um, do the composting. So um, you will find me in my yard in February. Definitely. And everybody's favorite um, lovely season. And I have to say, as a grower, spring, just thinking about spring gives me hives because it's just everything has to come together for me at once. Um, and I just, spring used to be like growing up my favorite season, but now it's fall. Fall is my favorite season. Um, but spring is when summer finally gets there, I'd like, Collapse because I, I, and I love it. I mean, I can't, I can't say that it's not my favorite because I really do love doing it. Um, but, you know, in early March, you need to be doing your bed prep. And, you know, it's going to be warm because everybody knows that a true SC spring is only two weeks if you're lucky. But this spring, if 2020 have, has gifted us with anything, our spring was phenomenal. Um, it was just the, one of the best springs I've ever experienced um, in my life um, living here. Um, so, you know, adding diversity in this season is so easy because you can just plant. So, um, I provided, uh, oh, and I added this in for Jay and I showed him this yesterday, but in my first month of living here, I moved in in February and in the very end of February, the Orioles had started to go back, um, uh, up North and my neighbor puts out oranges with grape jelly in them. And that was my first Oriole, never had seen Buddha. We don't have, we have like gross beaks and stuff that we'll see from time to time. But the Oriole, if you've never seen one in, in person, he's quite vibrant. And I was, I was like, I was stunned. And I was like, this is, this is going to be a good place to live, you know? Um, but so this is me in last week of February last year. Um, this is my backyard. Um, and the backyard is actually not finished to the way I wanted to show it to everybody, but I thought that I would show you some of my bed prep. And so what I told y'all about like getting in underneath the grass with a flat shovel, that was done all with a flat shovel. And, and a lot of you are like, oh my God, I can't do that right now. Well, you can rent sod cutters. They are wonderful things, but they will vibrate you to death. Um, I did this over a weekend. Um, I just ripped up all that grass. Um, and shook all the dirt off of it, took it to the road. The, the sanitation guys, I was actually home that week when they, they um, loaded it into the truck and I helped them because it was so heavy. Um, and really they were like, what is going on here? You are tearing up the world. I was like, I, it seems that way, but I'm not. Um, but while I did all of this and you know, I was, I was constantly being watched by my bluebird 
Um, and that, that fall I had put up nest boxes for the fall because I wanted to get them out way far ahead of time. Um, so he had already found the nest box, um, him and his mate. Um, but he seemed like he was more comfortable around me than most bluebirds I've ever encountered. So I would be hauling grass away and he'd find a grub underneath the grass. He'd immediately fly down like inches away from me. That picture of him sitting on the, the pots, I throw the pots like maybe five feet away from me. And he just sat there a little elevated watching me throw him grubs. And by the end of things, it was, it was one of those things where I would actually throw him grubs. He'd come down from the power line, grab it and go back up. And it I'm serious, one of the coolest experiences I've ever had, and it happened right here in this yard. Um, and just adding that that nest box, simple thing, but oh my gosh, the impact it made, uh, especially upon me. I, I I couldn't get over like how cool that was. So I, and I called him the warden because the warden is always watching. So he he's warden, and he he still exists. He's in the backyard probably right now fishing around. Um, and this. Uh, this panel over here is actually a, um, a video. So all of the plants, like once they get going in spring, you'll actually um, see, you know, the pollinators, um, the progeny of the pollinators. So up top we have a monarch caterpillar and down below it's a swallowtail. Um, and the swallowtail is on dill that I planted. Dill, uh, not a native, um, not a native plant, but it is wonderful at hosting that caterpillar. Um, the monarch is actually on some uh, milkweed that is in the backyard right now, and that was the spring when they're when they're actually migrating up. So one stopped on his way and laid some eggs right there. Um, this plant in the panel of the video that was playing, um, and I can play it again. Um, it's pycnanthemum. It, pycnanthemum muticum is uh, mountain mint. So if, if people up in Greenville, especially, this grows wild up in Greenville. It grows, uh, there are different species, a ton of different species of this plant, but um, pycnanthemum uh, grows all over the place. Um, it's kind of uh, weedy itself. It runs during the winter, so you'll see it pop up everywhere. It's so super easy to go and pull it. So I, that's what I do. I just pull it out of the beds um, and, and kind of condense it back to where I want. But if you notice in that video, the number of pollinators there, there's like three different types of bees. There's some wasps. I mean, you just don't get that going to every plant. Um, it's just, it's incredible. You see honeybees right there. Um, there's a, a small wasp right there. There's even some flies that I see and like the whole plant just vibrates in the spring because of all the bees on it. And e even people at work have told me in the, the mass plantings that we've done of this, that it's the number one pollinator plant that they have witnessed just uh, benefit the widest variety. Um, so. that, that's a fantastic video and I just love all these uh, pollinators on it. Um, you know, I've I'm, I'm just going to chime in here. Um, Go ahead. I've seen mountain mint in a you know native plant book, and I just disregarded it because we're not in the mountains, and I figured it would just die here. And you're a little no, bit no, it loves south, it here. south of me, I guess, and it's thriving. So, you know, um, the, the, this plant it, it doesn't it's not bothered by the heat here. No, uh, it actually does love it loves water. I will have to say it, it loves water. Um, especially in the, the year that it's first getting established. But after that, you know, and I'll touch on this again, I don't, I don't water um, a ton. So I'll touch on that later, but I don't, I don't, my philosophy with plants is if it has to have a ton of care and a ton of water, it doesn't deserve a place in my yard. I, I like tough plants. I like showy plants that are tough plants. And this mountain mint can grow it's growing in a, like a sandy loam kind of soil that we have here in Casey, but I also had it out in Saluda and that was hard red pen clay. So it loves both. Um, I, I don't notice a difference in it growing in either. Um, and this is, if there's any, um, this is going to be, this is being recorded and will be posted and I'm sure will be shared with um, the participants. Uh, but this page, if you take away anything of what to plant in spring, this page is great because this is like your, um, I would, I would call this the pollinator starter pack if you, if you wanted to. So um, I can go over most of these. Um, so 
especially Jay had a question yesterday to me about Rebecca Maxima. And I've put, um, I've put most of the um, common names beside them. Um, so Rebecca Maxima, my favorite, um, my favorite Rebecca, which is Black Eyed Susan. Um, but this one's called the Great Coneflower. It, I think it might be a prairie plant and probably one of those plants that was lost when we lost our Carolina prairies um, in the ecological span of time. But we used to have great uh, Carolina prairies out there. Um, and if you want to see a good Carolina prairie, go to South Carolina Botanical Garden. They have a, a beautiful one. Um, and this, this list, um, starting off with this Rebecca, um, I, I love it so much um, that I call it not a back garden plant. And um, like a laureate Mill Creek said the same thing and I didn't prompt her to say that, but it is truly a stunning thing. And I wish I, wish I could get a good picture of it, but they're, they're kind of hard to photograph because they're so tall. They're about, they're about six feet tall. Um, so when they get up there, it's just like, you know, flowers and sky. It's just like, you know, you can't, uh, you can't really have a good photograph of it, but they have beautiful blue green leaves, um, very large leaves for Rubecchia. And it's just different than anything you're going to see around here, I promise you. And Mill Creek greenhouses, I did get some from them last year. I hope that she has them again because I want more. Um, <laughs> but um, salvia, any, any of the perennial species, like the, the annual species are okay if you're attracting, uh, but we really want to perennialize our yard so that something comes back and we don't have to do more work putting in more annuals. And annuals are great for that pop of color in pots, in little small areas in your beds. And I'm not, I don't poo poo people wanting annuals because that's like the little bright spot in the middle of summer because you know they're gonna perform in the heat. Um, so I've already mentioned pycnanthemum, um, Asclepius tuberosa, which is the orange, uh, orange butterfly weed. Um, and then the picture that is the orange right there in the very middle and you cannot miss it. Um, especially in the mountains, in those mountain fields um, that you see, and they'll just pop up above that grass and just flower so beautiful and like proud. And um, I honestly, I've almost crashed before, especially, I think I was going up to Cashers one time and there was this beautiful, beautiful field and it just had a bunch of butterfly weed in the middle of it. And I, I swear I almost hit somebody. Um, and that would have been a, such an embarrassing ad admission to say I hit somebody because I was staring at a plant, but I, I would have done it. Um, the eutrochium, it used to be eupatorium, but now it's eutrochium. See, that's, it's tricky with Latin. That's Joe Pieweed. And if you don't know Joe Pieweed, you need to know Joe Pieweed because Joe Pieweed is one of those things that I have seen so many swallowtails on and they just like sit on it and like dance on it and they look like they're floating on this little purple cloud. It is so pretty. Um, as well as being beneficial to them, they, they love it. It's a huge nectar source for them. Um, and Little Joe is my favorite cultivar, and I've seen just tons of bees on there as well. Um, uh, Vernonia, the ironweeds, they can be up to 16 feet tall, or they can be as small as three feet tall. So you need to uh, really, uh, you can really pick the species that you want for your site. Um, I personally love the 16 foot tall ones because they are, ooh, just gigantic. I love big plants and I cannot lie. It's, I love uh, Vernonia gigantea. Ooh, it's just a beautiful, beautiful plant. And the, the deepest purple that you will ever find in any of the natives is Vernonia. Uh, Nepeta, Nepeta is catmint. Um, it's not catnip, although cat, <laughs> cat, Nip is also a nepeta. <laughs> so uh, catmint, uh, Walker's Low is a great one because you can put it at the very edge of your beds and it kind of makes this gray silvery little cloud and attracts so many. It's got that blue gray um, silvery uh, look to it. It's a great background plant for things like to bounce off of. Um, huge pollinator magnet. Everybody knows Echinacea. I recently found um, a new cultivar that I love for its performance called Pow Wow Wildberry. I found that at a local nursery around here. Um, Liatris, uh, commonly called Gay Feather. Um, every year, and I don't know if I sent this, I don't know if I sent that picture to Jay of just like the, the goldfinch is running up and down and just like ripping out seeds. And they've been like, I, I swear I'm going to have like Liatris coming up in the beds next year because they have just ripped out a ton, 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 ton of uh, seeds all over the place, probably eating some in the, in their weight. But um, 
verbena benariensis, um, purple top verbane. Everybody will know this plant because it is on the side of the road in ditches and next to fence lines. So when you see it, um, just know that that plant is hugely beneficial to a lot of things. I've seen goldfinches hang um, from the blooms and just pick out seeds from the blooms that are spent and just hang there and like bob up and down. It's, it's a, such a cool thing to see. Um, so that's that, that list of plants. I saw somebody ask about, um, are these plants good for fighting climate change? Anything you plant is good for fighting climate change except for invasives. But if you can, if you can plant in your yard anything but grass, you're fighting climate change. Yeah. Well, and you, and you talked uh, kind of about climate change earlier. I guess plants can tell us that the climate is changing with the with the plants that you can uh, you know plant now um, down at the coast. You said savanna with the uh, the citrus. Okay. I yeah. guess that's kind of uh, an um, indicator. I I did notice somebody saying um, that uh, they grow citrus down in Aiken, but I'm talking about citrus that is not on a rootstock that is hardy. I'm talking about citrus that is on its own rootstock that is planted in the ground and can survive. That citrus that you're growing in Aiken probably has what's called um, a Ponsiris uh, rootstock, which is, that's great. I hate, I love seeing them do well. I have never, it's not one of my things. And everybody's like, how can you not love that? I was like, it's a citrus. I can go buy it at, you know, Casey's Farmer's Market if I want to, but um, it's, it's just not one of my things. And I think they're incredibly beautiful. And especially the, the people that show up to Soda City Market, if you live in Columbia, they have great citrus. Um, All right, good, good to know. Hey, and I don't want to rush you, but it's 354, just in oh, case gosh. people have to, have to uh, you know, right. leave. but, um, you know, just feel free to, if you can, stay a little bit later and answer. Oh, it. yeah, I, I, oh, can I can definitely, yeah. Okay, all right, cool. Um, so... Summer, um, and I, that list, we'll make that list available to you, I'm sure. Um, so summer, um, what I'm gonna tell you here is just get through it. Um, summer is really, it's a lot in South Carolina, especially down towards the coast. It can just get unbearably hot. Anybody um, that, that's here, I did see some people from not in South Carolina that are joining in, but welcome, it gets hot here. Um, so just weeding, watering, and fertilizing, and what I like to fertilize with is um, either compost tea. So compost tea, if you make your own compost, you can actually steep it in water in like a five gallon jug in like pantyhose, like your grandmother's pantyhose, they're good for something after all. You can fill it full of um, compost and let it steep in there and just wring it out um, when, you know, a couple of uh, hours after you put it in there or even overnight. I like to do it overnight. And so just, you know, add a, add a little bit of that um, around. I do it to my containers too. Um, also, I use, I use a product called uh, MicroLife and that's, it's not a plug for them, but I, I just like it because it's organic. And MicroLife, I believe is out of Texas and they, it's sold on, you know, the, it's sold online so you can go find it. Um, and I think that Fall Line Hort, over um, in Rosewood sells it uh, too in bigger in bigger jugs, so it's it's just a wonderful product. Um, and the compost should be really enough fertilizer. If you're composting regular, I'd say two, twice a year, you're good. You really don't have to add any supplemental um, uh, fertilization. Now for watering, people are always kind of shocked when I say this, but I don't water my garden like every day. <laughs> uh, so the, the rule with watering, and this is, this is completely true, and I have done this since day one of putting in this, this landscape. Um, I water for two hours on a Sunday. That's it. Two hours on a Sunday. I have a drip irrigation system, so there's hoses that run through this, um, and it's like that, that thick plastic hose that has emitters in it. So, and I just picked that up at the big box store. Um, so, it it puts out like two or three gallons a, a minute or something like that. I forget what it is, but uh, I run it for two hours continuously and then I just shut it off. Um, and so the water goes deep. It goes really deep into the ground. It promotes root group growth down into that zone where the sun can't get to it. So those roots are harvesting water from a place where the sun is not so harsh. Because if you, if you have 
the way to create weak plants is to weekly water. That's, that's usually the rule. So if you water weak, which means like 15 minutes at a time, you're not really doing anything. That's evaporating during the day. So you want to get that penetrated deep. Um, you also want to mulch and mulch. I usually mulch in the very early spring, like I said in February, double hammered hardwood natural mulch is the best thing to use. Um, you can use the dyed mulch. I don't encourage people to use red dyed mulch just because of the way it looks, but that's a personal preference. Um, I have used the brown dyed mulch before. Um, you might ought to ask your mulch provider what kind of dye is in their mulch because a lot of them are soy based, which is good. Soy based is good. If it's not soy based, you should just kind of question what that is and see what, it, what that dye is and if you're comfortable putting it on your plants. Um, so, in summer, really adding diversity just means keeping those plants healthy. Um, if you notice any disease or, of course, you can, you can find out what that disease is from your extension agent and they will recommend both a natural um, way to take care of it and a chemical way. I, the, the best way is to stray away from chemicals if you can. And if it's a plant that just is so fussy, do you really need the plant, I mean, it's, it's, if it's a lot of work and you're just devoting way too much time to it, that's the way I think about things. So um, you can, you can create a beautiful yard without having fussy plants, I promise. Um, so the summer really, what I'd love to do in the mornings is get out, especially, you know, on a Sunday morning, I get out and I water my containers because I have a lot of containers because I'm a plant nerd and I, I love different things. Um, especially growing large, like large trees, but from like a gallon plant, I'll put them in a container and put some annuals around them. And, and I like when that tree is fully grown in that container, I just plant it in the yard. That's a, that's a little tip. Um, so if you, if you like something, but it's too expensive, buy it in a gallon container, grow it in a bigger container until it gets to the size you can plant it in your yard. And that way you grew the plant and you knew how healthy it was, then you put it in your yard. Um, but this season is all about getting out and observing. And on Sunday mornings, I go out there with a cup of coffee and I water my containers and I just kind of chill out in my own yard. And that's the, that's the nicest thing about getting out there and doing all this is just chilling out in, in the spaces you've created. Um, and so now like a word about diversity, it's um, diversity is not the sterile lawn. And, and I'm sure some of you have seen the, the shirt, and I love this shirt, um, not, not because of its message, but because there's, there's a great coneflower right there, the Rebecca Maxima. Um, and somebody in Iowa actually created the shirt. I did not, I, I don't take any um, credit for creating this shirt. I just love the shirt. Um, got tons of compliments in the mountains from a landscape architecture group that was up there for this shirt. So they're, they're doing some ecological uh, landscaping up there. Um, but diversity and ecological abundance in your yard is not long. If you're cutting that grass down every, you know, week or two weeks, it's not, you're not creating a home for anything. So really your ecological abundance is just like letting nature, um, you know, nature, if you, lawns are not very common in nature unless you look at the prairie. And if you want to call a prairie a lawn, I don't think that you're really getting what a prairie is. Um, so if you, if you Google like, a list of plants in a prairie, that is a super, super diverse list. Prairies are one of the most ecologically diverse habitats in the, in the world. So uh, people think that their lawns are supporting things and they're not really. Um, and, you know, not all lawns are just grass and that's a good thing. Sometimes uh, lawns are um, something, you know, like the sedges or moss even. Up in the mountains, I saw a lot of like moss lawns and stuff like that, which are really cool. Um, I don't know how much diversity they support either, but I'd rather have garden beds and minimize that lawn down to like, just, you know, I, I think of lawns as kind of like an accent to your better plants. And, uh, you know, I, I think that, uh, <laughs> I think that people get a little um, cagey with me about like telling me to decrease the size of their lawn. I was like, why do you want to spend more time in August cutting your lawn when it's 90 something degrees and you could be out there for 30 minutes and then, you know, turn on your irrigation for the beds around and like go back inside, you know? And it's just like that, that's, 
I kind of lead with that argument, but the lawn, uh, it doesn't do anything for water retention either. Um, lawn sucks up a lot of water and fertilizer, if that's your thing. Um, I, I honestly do not fertilize or do anything to my lawn. The thing that I do for my lawn is throw Dutch clover seeds all over the place uh, to give a little bit of green in the winter and provide flowers in the spring. And so I, I, I don't mind it. I don't walk in my yard barefoot because of like, I don't want to step on the bees and do all that kind of stuff. Um, but if you, abundance and ecological diversity doesn't mean that you have to sacrifice everything that you know and love. So you don't have to be completely native. You can grow your vegetables. I, grow, I grew these tomatoes in a garden bed that's actually on the other side of this window. Um, that was the most abundant tomato I've ever grown. Um, but I grew them in a bed with solidago and with salvias and asclepias all right there, all sitting right there together. I actually had um, monarch chrysalis on my tomato cage uh, last month. It was, that was a pretty cool thing to see. Um, so with this whole approach to things, you'll notice a difference the first year out, but it's going to get so much better if you just keep doing it and like you being patient with it and, and just doing it. It's like an exercise routine for your yard. If you just stay with it for the long term, it's going to be much, much better. And people are going to, people stop me all the time and they're like, um, who does your yard? And I'm like, Oh, I, I do my garden. And, um, they're like, Oh, it must take you forever. I was like, I haven't actually been out here other than to water all summer. And that is the truth of it. <laughs> so I do my work in the spring and I'm, I'm fixing to get ready in the, the fall to, to do some stuff. But yeah. Um, the other big thing that you have to remember is to say no to invasive plant species. Um, like I said about the Nandina, they, the flippers put that Nandina out in front of the house. And that was the first thing I ripped out of this yard was that Nandina and they hadn't even gotten a chance to root in yet. Um, but it's just like, do your homework and look at the invasive species list on the USDA. And they'll even, I mean, what is invasive here will not be invasive like in uh, New York state or even in Virginia. A lot of it has to depend upon how cold your winters get. So just look at the list, what's invasive for the state of South Carolina and you should be good. And so my philosophy, and I touched on this a little bit is 75, 25. So 75% natives. And I'm not, I don't, I don't go crazy about like whether the native is a cultivar or that means a variety um of that native i i look at cult, certain native bars i'm sure don't have the same um benefit as you know the the straight species but i think that if you're if you're planting green things other than grass i think you're good and other than of course invasive species um but you know all plants will give cover to things all plants give cover for birds they give uh, opportunities for nesting uh, materials. They give opportunities for nest sites um, and they give nectar sources. They give, um, a, you know, host plants uh, give all kind of benefits to caterpillars. Um, when you're covering the ground in plants, you're usually increasing the soil diversity because all of those roots are going down in there and creating um, air pockets. And I, I will say, like, after doing this in the front yard, I noticed, like, when you, you know, when you pull up plants or you dig in the soil a little bit around um, plants, you see that web of like spongy white roots and you think, oh gosh, that plant, those, those plant roots don't look good at all. That is a uh, mycelium. So that's a fungus. And everybody think, oh God, it's going to get on my plants and it's going to kill them. Fungus works in correlation and symbiosis with plants. And it is a beautiful thing. Fungus unlocks nutrients in the soil, which then plants can use. And I highly, highly recommend that you don't try to go spraying fungicides everywhere. When you see those mushrooms come up in your yard, just like give them a, the applause that they deserve because they are working for you. They are just doing work in your garden and they are doing something that you don't even have to lift a finger for and that is unlocking nutrients. Um, and so now let's, I'll talk about a little bit about Carol Reese and uh, Doug Talmy. Carol Reese is actually an extension agent for the University of Tennessee that I had the pleasure of seeing when I went to a conference um, uh, quite recently in Florida. Uh, well, quite recently, meaning last year. Um, so, and I'm sure a lot of you know Doug Talmy if you're engaged with um, any kind of sustainable landscaping. Doug Talmy is an ecological um, 
entomologist. Uh, he loves in, he loves bugs. So he is he is very straight laced when it comes to only planting natives in your yard. Um, and he, and I've seen him speak many times. Um, he is a he is a wonderful human being. Um, Carol and him go back. They trade barbs quite often because she she will she will kind of ruffle his feathers in that like she loves um she loves planting non-natives in her yard and that doesn't mean that she plants invasive that means she plants things like hosta you know and uh she will always make the argument that in the fossil record two million whatever years ago ginkgo was found in north america in what is now north america um so a ginkgo biloba um, the ginkgo tree that um, is native to china was actually here. So when you plant a ginkgo tree in your yard, are you just reintroducing a native or are you planting exotic? And that's, that gets Doug just like all riled up. And I, I just think it's so funny. But the, the, the mission of these two individuals is plant mu much more than grass. It's yards and gardens are much more about grass. It's whether you want to call it a yard or a garden, Plant diversity always reigns supreme. So plant a diverse palette, plant as many as you can, let them spread, let them do what they want um, to a certain extent. I mean, you're the gardener, you, you like what you like, um, but plant diversity always reigns supreme in this situation. And so this is final slide. Um, so again, soil. If you leave here with one thing, it should be soil. Go out and hug your ground uh, because it's doing so much for you, you don't even know. Um, and you can, you always, you are always the determinant factor in how diverse your uh, landscape can be. You can encourage it or you can discourage it. So always choose to encourage it. Uh, small changes always bring the big rewards. Like I said, with just putting up that nest, nest box out there, that's a, that's a huge, like, I can't tell you how overjoyed I was to see that bluebird just sitting there like anticipating me making my next move. It was, and, and bluebirds are one of my favorite birds, you know, in that time of year, they're just bright. They're bright and blue. Um, so your plant selection also, um, that list of plants that I gave you, they are mostly natives. I will say that they're, they're mostly natives. I think one or two of them are not. Um, and if you want to plant all natives, that's great. I don't discourage that at all. I like plants and that's that is so apparent from the yard um, people are like oh my gosh where did you find that from I was like well I found you know it was you know in a magazine that we get and it wasn't out to the public yet and we just I had to have it so I ordered it from the guy who runs the nursery that kind of thing so it's like I like rare and exotic stuff but if you like native stuff that's great don't don't let anybody harsh your vibe on that um, and so what and leave with you have the absolute <sighs> determining factor in your ecological health in your landscape. Now, I will have to say the most rewarding thing about moving into this what what country folks like me and Jay would call the city. I call Casey the city um, just because when we were growing up, that Columbia was the big city to us, and a, a lot of folks are laughing on the call right now. I know, but. Um, you have an impact on what your neighbors are doing. And I, I always call it like the peeking over the fence syndrome. As soon as I started to do all this stuff, other people around the neighborhood started to ask. And it was like, started with the neighbor across the street. The neighbor next door has gotten so many plants from me. So you have the ability to do it. Don't think that you, like you think you're a small cog. Small cogs get a lot of stuff done. They have a lot of torque and you can get it done. Um, so don't think that your yard or your garden is ever not impactful to your neighborhood and your surrounding community. And no yard is ever completely lost. If you are at a loss of what to do, always start with your soil. So build from there and right, right then, the base of your pyramid should be soil and then move up from there. And the pinnacle is you just sitting up there Happy as a, a clam, you know, looking at all of your diversity and um, enjoying your yard or your garden. 
<laughs> um, and this this last pet, that's a video. And I just took that of a, that is a non-native sunflower that I planted in the front of the house. It's um, Helianthus debilis. Um, debilis is a branching sunflower and that that is one called Italian white. Um, but now I will like give it over to Jay and everything. Thank y'all so much for listening. I know I've talked a lot. <laughs> You're going to give it over to me, but I'm going to give it over, you know, to you <laughs> Again, with, with question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, hey, man, uh, you know, I'm not uh, eloquent enough to tell you, you know, all, all the great things um, that, that, that have been going through my mind, you know, during this presentation. But, man, I mean, you just knocked it out of the park. And, I can't and if I haven't answered anybody's question, y'all can. I haven't. I've looked at the chat and I saw some questions that I really wanted to answer. But if you if you want to ask that question again, that's fine. Um, and I see something about nest box preferences and maybe you could do that. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll talk about that. Um, but you know, there were, there were some that I saw earlier as well. Um, there was one about mushroom, um, compost or okay. uh, mushroom manure. Um, it, it was, is it good to you? So what, what are your thoughts on that? So mushroom compost is always a good thing to use mushroom compost, especially, um, of, of most of all the composts. It traps water because those mushrooms, boy, they are wonderful, wonderful little decomposers. Um, so what you will usually find is it's really clumpy. Um, it's just, it's holding on to a lot of water. And if you're, if that's mixing in your soil, usually like the, the microbes and the fungus that's already in your soil, they want to get to all of that. That's moisture that's hanging on. So it gets, it gets absorbed in the soil super, super quick. Um, it provides a water holding capacity that is just bar none. I love it. Um, I have only seen certain landscape supply companies uh, truly provide the clean, like the clean uh, mushroom compost that doesn't have sand in it. And I prefer to get it without sand in it because that's just inert material. You'll hear that, that term a lot in like fertilizer. Inert material is stuff that's just there for filler. It's like that bag of potato chips that once was full is now is like down here. It's like all air, you know, that, that's the kind of thing. But if it, if they add sand, I, I would try to find uh, another, um, another way around that. A lot of people add uh, bark to it too, which is not a bad thing because um, pine bark, especially can uh, pine fines can um, bust up clay soils naturally over time. Okay, great. And to the next nest box uh, question, um, gosh, I mean, anything uh, that's a cavity nester, um, whether that's a bluebird, uh, and make sure you put those up uh, at um, or by uh, Valentine's Day as well. Absolutely. Um, but screech owls, think about that and everything oh, yes. that Eric has done um, yes. on the property. You know, if, if you have some, you know, larger trees or you have a forest nearby, um, you know, all that the, the insects he was talking about mm -hmm. in the grass that he leaves up during the wintertime, you know, the screech owls are eating that. They eat worms, um, you know, a high number of them, actually. Um, you know, some birds and some bats. So, you know, think about screech owls if you have the right habitat. But uh, great crested flycatcher, that's a neotropical migrant that comes up here from the, from the tropics, of course. And uh, they, they're in decline as well because of, uh, you know, cavity, uh, a lack of cavities and other reasons. But uh, chickadees, titmice, um, if you yeah. put a bluebird house up, you know, you can possibly, I had, I had first chickadees in my bluebird box this year, and then I had a uh, bluebird. So uh, just put up the, the cavity box um, uh, and, and the bird, the birds will come. Um, and let me get to a couple more things here. Okay, what would you use to improve drainage in and above ground uh, veggie garden um, containing topsoil soil and compost? Ooh, so that has a lot to do with what's sitting underneath the, um, the race beds. So if there's like hard pan clay underneath it, uh, it's not going to drain. So what I usually tell people to do is I usually like them to use a mix instead of like buying topsoil because those are technically just like giant containers. If you think about it, it's like use, use like a good, um, um, potting soil mix would be good. You can add in some uh, some more compost if you want to make it a little bit more heavy, but the clay is really your issue. Um, now, if you like the the drainage issue with that, the clay is just not going to allow you to to do anything like that. I'm sorry. Um, like a good gravel base would have been nice, uh, but it 
it, I, I don't know the situation that it's in, but it's, uh, I had, I had a raise, I had a few raised beds in Saluda and I noticed them in the winter, particularly getting really wet and like I, I would grow collards in them. Um, and they would dampen off, like they would just rot off sometimes. And I, I kind of gave up on the raised beds the, because I, I went to that whole, like, let's bust up the clay with natural methods and just plant the college in the ground, you know? Mm. But I, I do understand the benefit of raised beds. They give uh, people, especially um, older folks and people with disabilities, a way to garden. And I love that. Um, and, and, you know, and that picture of your uh, compost that you that you purchased for twenty bucks a uh, you know a load. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a difference way in in the way that you would apply that in in your clay rather than somebody that has sandier soil, or is it the same? Um, I would I would say it's the exact same. Uh, I I prefer a no till method. Uh, now, I did, I, I, in Saluda, I was very much pro tilling that clay because I thought that, you know, you could get a layer of clay tilled into that compost. And what I would do is uh, I would till up the clay, lay compost over it, and then till it all back in. And that's perfectly acceptable, um, especially when you're making new beds. Um, the, the thing that you have to consider is destroying soil structure. And I don't know if I touched on soil structure or not, but soil structure is like, the um, the air gaps in between uh, layers of soil and in clay soil structure is really tight so that's why it holds on to a lot of water especially if it gets wet and stays wet now clay when you amend it you can amend it with mushroom compost because mushroom compost gets in there and it it breaks bonds and stuff in the clay and allows nutrients to expand mm. so uh, especially with mushroom compost and clay mix in pine fines to your mushroom compost and then put it on top of the clay and then plant through that if you do a no-till method and if you want to till that's fine too I've, I've never discouraged anybody from tilling although i've had really good results from not tilling and it's a whole lot less work <laughs> yeah 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 hey um and just real quick so on some bird boxes yeah if you put them on a pole um that's fantastic but if you put them on a pole with a predator guard you're going to basically eliminate any predation on those on those birds. So yeah, pole, um, never, I mean, never say never, I guess, but I, I don't put any of mine on directly on trees. Um, you know, there's the rat snakes are going to get to them, <clears throat> but, um, yeah, just, uh, put them on a pole with a predator guard and you should be good. Um, and I have to say like the first, the, in the first month of living here, I put up four nest boxes, a chickadee, two bluebirds and a nut hatch. And I got birds in every single one of them. Yeah, I mean that easy, and it's and so you, easy. It is so easy. Yeah, you think about the brown-headed nuthatch. That's a bird that's declined significantly, you know, due to loss of habitat, but loss of cavities as well, right? Um, so, uh, you know, people don't want snags in their yard because they snags fall. You know, uh, some people have you know died because of that. So, you know, if you have one that's that's unsafe, I understand you, the the point of taking it down. But you know, if you do have to do that, put up a a, a nest box. I mean. <laughs> Uh, he had four, and, and you said all four were used? All four of them, yeah. All four of them got um, birds. He's in the big city of, of Casey. The <laughs> big city of Casey. Um, I wanted to get to this one. What's the best time of day to water? Um, I usually love doing it in the morning, just okay. because, especially if you're overhead wa watering, it gives the, the leaves a chance to, die, uh, to dry out, and so you don't have a fungal issue after that. Okay. Okay, awesome. Especially um, in our hot and humid summers, you really need to give it a chance to dry out. Watering like just before um, dusk is not recommended just because that water is going to sit on that plant all night. And, you know, sometimes in South Carolina, Okay, um, and sorry, I, I think I cut yeah. out for a little bit. Um, oh, but, I'm sorry. What one one extra question? Uh, any species that you would recommend? Um, I'm sure there are for shady or dappled shade areas. Uh, some maybe a, a favorite or two. Ooh, dappled. Um, some of the like hmm, shady. Some of the asters do really well um, in a semi-shady kind of area. There are a lot of sedges that do really well. Um, there are also like. Um, 
those those little woodland um oh gosh i i don't know the common name and this is going to get somebody but boltonia uh boltonia is a is a good one um how do you, do you I, know how to spell that b o l t o n i a Let's see. What's well, in this? Does it make sense if it's in the sunflower family? Yeah, it's in the it's in the asteraceae family. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Great. Um, and aster is you know one of the best host plants right there uh, next to goldenrod. You know, um, so fantastic recommendation. Um, yeah. And somebody that had a bluebird question. Uh, yeah. If you haven't had bluebirds uh, at your house for a couple of years, uh, I would move it um, and just make sure it's facing an open area. Um, you know, don't have it facing the woods or any thick areas, but um, yeah, just, just move and see, see what happens, um, you know, this, uh, this spring. Um, hey, listen, I, I don't want to keep you any, any longer, Eric. Uh, if we didn't get to any questions, um, you know, we'll, we'll send out an, an email and hopefully we'll, we'll have it answered then. Um, thank you so much again. It is, You're we've been talking for an hour and 25 minutes. So congratulations. Yay. <laughs> um, and, and I'm sure, you know, the, the many people that are still on could have you talk for another, you know, uh, 30 minutes at least. So I, I honestly could talk about this all day, but um, yeah, yeah. Uh, me and you alike. Uh, so thank Thanks again, Eric. Um, thank you all for all you know you do, and thank you all for the great questions. Honestly, that was that was fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, and, and we'll have this on on YouTube, and we'll send out an, an email with the link and everything, so y'all can uh, do like me and watch it again. So, uh, <laughs> thanks for the support, everybody. And if you like this class um, and you want to see more, um, remember we're we're nonprofit, and uh, if if you'd like to support us financially, just go to our website um scwf.org and we'd appreciate any uh any donations so thanks everybody and uh thank you one more time eric i appreciate it bud you're very welcome man all right yeah, everybody be good yep all right bye